for uh, Matt to be gone. Matt left for Peru on Friday. The whole group left. And uh, Danny's filling in, and what a blessing he is. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Danny. Okay. All right. Our pastor, uh, of course, he's been on a mission trip to Uganda the past 10 days. Uh, they just flew in this morning. They got in safely at 9.30 uh, this morning. And then, our, of course, our Peru trip, they arrived safely. And so we need to just keep on praying for them. Our kids go to camp uh, this afternoon, actually. We leave about 3 p.m. this afternoon, and we go. And uh, I know we have several volunteers in here. Some of them may be working. If you're volunteering uh, to serve as a counselor at, at kids camp. Stand up. If y'all could stand up for me, I'd really appreciate it. Carly Eaton Warren. All right. Amen to that. Thank y'all so much. I'll be headed down there with them, and God has really blessed our summers. Uh, our, this summer with Adventure Week and Youth Camp was amazing, uh, and our mission trips, and we just pray that God would really move uh, at our kids' camp this week. We're excited to go. It looks like the weather's going to be good. We may get a little wet, uh, but it looks like the weather's not going to be too hot, so we're really blessed with that. So join me in a word of prayer as we pray for all these groups. Lord Jesus, uh, we come into your presence, and we just want to thank you. Uh, for just blessing our summer. We just cannot thank you enough. We owe it all to you. We thank you for being with our youth at uh, youth camp in Colorado and how you blessed them and how kids came to know you and kids got baptized. And Lord, what a blessing that is. And Lord, we just want to thank you for Adventure Week, um, for all you did and how you moved at Adventure Week this summer. And Lord, we just thank you for the Uganda mission trip and for all the wonderful things that have come out of that and how those ladies' lives have been changed. And Lord, we we continue to pray for the Peru trip that you would just keep them safe and watch over them as they minister. Um, Lord, just uh, help them just uh, really share uh, your word and your good news. And Lord, we pray for kids camp coming up this week that you would just, uh, we just want to thank you for the beautiful weather that we're going to have. And Lord, I just want to pray that Kids Camp would just go smooth and we would drive down there safely and um, that we would have a great time and that these kids would uh, draw closer to you in every way. Lord, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Lee asked me to preach about a week and a half ago, and uh, I, had, I haven't preached in a while. Uh, actually, I'm usually always doing kids worship at this hour, and so um, usually... Um, you know, uh, when Lee asked me, I usually have a sermon uh, that I've been thinking about. And uh, but man, when he asked me, um, I, I I was like, oh my goodness, what do I what do, what do I preach on? And so, when you preach on something that you don't preach on like every single week, it's just really difficult to just find one topic. And so I just I you know I prayed about it, and uh, my first uh, I, I kind of wanted to preach on ten reasons that I love my church. And uh, that was really easy to kind of come up with that list. And then I went back and forth, um, and God kind of put something really random on my heart. And, uh, and I'm not sure why. Um, you know, I was talking to Joy about it, and just, you know, why God, and, and maybe God wants you to hear this message this morning. I know this message is, uh, uh, is applicable to all of us um, as we live in this culture. And so I'm going to be talking uh, in the book of Daniel and normally when we, when we talk about Daniel, we think about obviously Daniel and how he stood firm and, and placed his faith in God and how he committed to, to be pure and, uh, you know, even living there in Babylon. We always think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, obviously. Uh, we think of them in the fiery furnace and them for standing up uh, and, uh, and not bowing down uh, to the large Nebuchadnezzar idol. Um, and so we think of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. And there's so much in uh, Daniel. There's a lot of prophecy. There's a lot of dreams interpreted. So today, uh, what I would like to focus on is actually King Nebuchadnezzar. And, uh, and he has a very interesting relationship with God. Uh, I'm amazed as I went through this, uh, this past week and going over this, how much God really um, kind of communicated with him and how he gave God, how, he, how God gave Nebuchadnezzar a lot of chances. And so, um, you know, uh, just a little history of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he reigned from 605 to 562 B.C. 
For 40 years, he ruled the Babylonian Empire. He was responsible for creating the first world empire. He conquered Assyria, Egypt, Judah, and the most important one, his kind of claim to fame, was he conquered Jerusalem. And uh, when he when he took now, not only was he a great a great warrior, uh, he was a great builder. He really wanted to build a massive empire, and he's responsible. He he built a forty foot wall um, around Babylon, and it was wide enough for them to do chariot races, actually around the city of Babylon. So he he was also obviously you've probably heard of the famous hanging gardens which were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, and so he, the terraces on this garden were 65 feet tall, and everything he did was just over the top. And he was just, uh, uh, just an incredible king in many, many ways. Now, the only problem was he thought of himself as God. He thought he was, was a God. He built a gold statue of himself, 90 feet high and nine feet wide. And so to give you some reference, our gym in there is 21, you know, it's 22 feet high. And so you go in there, this is probably maybe 50 feet high. So if you kind of double this, he built a statue of gold uh, of himself, 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. So he was definitely very, very proud of himself. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar was probably the richest and most powerful man on earth during that time. Now, I want to take you to Daniel chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Now, this is a, a great illustration about how everything in your life on the outside is going awesome. I mean, you're, you're, you're man, you're successful, and everything seems to be moving along at the same time. But on the inside, you're kind of a mess. And this is a, a good example of Nebuchadnezzar. So I'm going to start here in Daniel chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. I, Nebuchadnezzar, I was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. So here he was in his palace, just enjoying everything he's done, 35 years of war and conquering places. And finally, he was, he was kind of entering into kind of a rest, peaceful time. And he had done all these things for the Babylonian empire. And so here he was in his beautiful palace. And, and he is, uh, he's there and he, is, he's, he's, he becomes afraid. And the reason why he becomes afraid is because he had a dream. God was speaking to him uh, in, in a dream, and he had a dream, and he woke up, and he was really a, afraid of what was going on. Everything looked good on the outside, but on the inside, here he was, the king of Babylon, probably one of the greatest kings that, that's ever, you know, uh, lived, uh, and here he is, and he's afraid because of this dream. So in Daniel four ten through 16, it says this, these are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed." So in verse 13, in the visions I saw lying in my bed, I looked and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. And it's interesting, you know, some of the translations say a watcher, you know, and most definitely heaven was watching, watching Nebuchadnezzar. And, and so he was either sent this through an angel, some type of messenger from God. And so God was watching him. And in verse 14, he called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants and the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, 
and let him be given the mind of an animal till the seven times, basically seven years, passes away. So he woke up from this dream and he was really afraid. He didn't know what it meant. And so obviously Daniel had interpreted dreams for him before. And so he calls for Daniel and to give him help to interpret that dream. And then in uh, Daniel 4.22, so it says here that Daniel, and by the way, when Daniel was summoned, man, the Bible says he really prayed to God. God, show me the answer, you know, to his, his vision. And he really took quite a bit of time in interpreting this. And, and te- really the dream kind of scared Daniel as, as well. And so, because he was afraid to tell the king what, what this dream meant. And so in verse 22, Daniel said, your majesty, you are that tree. And if you want to think for a moment, this also reminds me of Nathan when Nathan confronted David about his sin. And Nathan says to King David, you are that man. And so the similarity here is, 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 is interesting because, you know, Daniel turns around and said, I'm sorry to say this, King, but you are literally that tree. And this is what he says. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. And then in Daniel 4, 24 and 27, Daniel interprets the dream for him. And he said, your majesty, this is the decree of the most high has issued against my Lord, the king. You will be driven away from the people and you will live like the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times, so seven years, you will will pass by you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you. And when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And in verse 27, this is, you know, you would think, wow, this is an incredible uh, dream and an incredible, uh, you know, God has spoken and God, you know, this is final. It's absolutely final. But I, what I want you to see mostly in this scripture is that this is, this is not final. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a chance. Nebuchadnezzar has some hope. And this is what, what Daniel said. Daniel said, very simply, renounce your sins by doing what is right. And your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. And because um, it, it's, it's, it was written about Nebuchadnezzar that he had a beautiful empire, beautiful kingdom, and a huge wall around, but everybody else was, was oppressed and poor. And he didn't treat uh, those that were poor very well at all in his kingdom. And so God is calling him out on this, and God is saying, listen, you know, you need to renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. So if you can imagine, so here's King Nebuchadnezzar and here's Daniel. And Daniel has given an incredible interpretation of this dream that he had. And then, and all of a sudden, here's King Nebuchadnezzar hearing this truth. This is, you are the big tree. You are going to be cut down. You are going to become like an animal. And then Daniel offers some hope to Nebuchadnezzar and says, you know what, there's, there's time for you to turn. And then I want you to take a look at Daniel 4, 28 and through 33. So in verse 28, it says, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later. Now I want, I want, I want that to kind of sink into all of us here, especially including myself, that God is, God is giving Nebuchadnezzar 365 days to repent. He's given him, he's given him some time here, 12 months for him to think about that dream and the consequences that are, that are going to happen to him. And King Nebuchadnezzar completely ignores what Daniel said 
or really what God said to him. And so we pick it up here in verse 28. 12 months later as the king, 12 months later as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. So we get a clear picture of where Nebuchadnezzar's heart is. I built all of this. This was me. Every victory that I've had was because of me. I built all this, and obviously you can picture him standing on that porch looking at you know, the hanging gardens and looking at all the statues and looking at all the things. And he is really so full of himself and so puffed up and so arrogant. And here he is, that 12 months, he has not changed one bit. And so here he is just disregarding that, uh, that interpretation of that dream. And so um, th- verse 31, even as the words were on my lips, on his lips, A voice came from heaven. This is what I decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, interestingly enough, God has spoken to Daniel through in his dreams. Obviously, he he spoke through Daniel uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, but he never talked to Nebuchadnezzar personally. And 12 months later, God speaks in an audible voice to Nebuchadnezzar. And he basically says, your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from the people and you will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times, seven years will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign. He's the one in control. He's the one that gave you all this over all kingdoms on the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Verse 33, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and he ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claw of uh, the, the, excuse me, like the claws of a bird. So essentially, I mean, I originally titled this sermon, when God turned a man into an animal. He turned a man into an animal. And that's essentially what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven out of his kingdom and he was forced to just be a beast, literally in the fields, eating grass with, with the other animals. And God humbled him for seven years. For seven years, he had to go through that that pain uh, away from God. He finally came back and he acknowledged God. And he acknowledged that he was was the Lord. And he he prays this beautiful prayer that I owe everything to God. And so we see a drastic turnaround in Nebuchadnezzar's life. So the point that I'm making here, though, is it took... Nebuchadnezzar had 12 months... And then he had seven years to repent to God. And so I, you know, I start thinking about that. And surely King Nebuchadnezzar was wise to listen to what God has done. Obviously, he showed up at the fiery furnace. And then he showed up in the lion's den. And here he is still full of himself. And so Nebuchadnezzar did not want to repent. He did not want to change. Now, you might ask, well, okay, Sean, that's, you know, you know, well over 2,600 years ago. What is, how does that apply to my life now? So instead of a dream, I want you to kind of think about all the sermons that you've listened to. On this, like on this very morning, you sit in the pews and you, you sit, and then the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And the Holy Spirit kind of, kind of says, and the Holy Spirit puts his finger on something in your life. And, and, he's, and, he, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, you need to, you need to fix that. You need to change that. But what do we do? And I do this as well. We, we get up after the service is over. We get into our cars. We have lunch. And then we start our week again on Monday. And we totally forget, completely forget about what the Holy Spirit prompted us to do that Sunday morning. Think about a Bible study that you've gone to. And God again talk, speaks to you again. 
through the Holy Spirit. And he says, hey, you need to, you need to take care of this. You need to, you need to make this right. You need, to, you need to kind of handle this. Think about when you're in your car and you're just driving down the road and uh, all of a sudden God speaks to you. And you kind of go, oh, yeah, God, man, I really need to take care of that. But, you know, you go about your, your day and you do things. And, you know, maybe you're on your back porch having a cup of coffee. Maybe you're even having your quiet time and you're going through the Bible and God says, hey, I need you to take care of this. I, I, need, you to, I need you to work on this area of your life. And time and time again, you get up from your quiet time, you know, you shower and then you head off to work or whatever you're going to do. If you're a student, you go to school and you essentially, you completely ignore what God has asked you to do. I, I do this as well. So, uh, so we, we, we do this over and over. And so a lot of times we'll read Nebuchadnezzar's story and we go, how Nebuchadnezzar, how did you miss why did you go through those seven years of pain and problems in your life and become like an animal? How, how, why didn't you turn? But you know, the reality of it is we do the same thing. We, we, we do the same thing every day. The Holy Spirit wants to communicate with us, to glorify Jesus Christ in our lives, to convict us of our sins, but yet we go about, about our day and we continually kind of, we say, oh, I'll take care of that later. I'll, I'll, I'll do that later. And so we, we have a tendency to just avoid God. And we, we put it off just, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. Now, could it be that the Holy Spirit is, is telling you that you have a particular sin in your life you need to, you need to work on? You have a sin in your life that, man, has been plaguing you for a long time, and you need to deal with it. Could the Holy Spirit be saying, hey, you need to fix that relationship. You know that relationship that you have? You need to, you need to go ask their forgiveness, or you need to forgive them. Or could it be that God has said, uh, hey, uh, you need to work on your marriage. You need to quit treating your spouse like that. You need to... You need to quit saying that. You need to quit acting like that. You know, could the Holy Spirit just, just be in your life? You're about to make a decision, and you're not including God. And, it's, and that decision is perhaps going to take you away from God even more. And you really haven't sat down. You really haven't prayed about it. You really haven't gone through it. You haven't sought out counsel. You haven't gone, th- gone through all that stuff. And you have, you, you've, you've really, God, God is kind of warning you like he warned in Cain. You know, right before Cain was about to kill Abel, God intervened and said, Cain, stop. What are you doing? Sin is crouching at your door. Sin is about to overtake you. And obviously, Cain, just like Nebuchadnezzar, just like us, we ignored it. We ignored God saying, stop, repent. You know, you need to work on this area of your life. And so we have, we just have a tendency. What about if you're, you know, let, let's say you're just, you're just not a very nice person. You're just not, you're mean. You're mean at work. You're, you treat people uh, with disrespect. You don't love them like you should. And, and you're, you're just, you're just treating them poorly like Nebuchadnezzar. And interestingly enough, God really, really put, said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're treating your people terrible. You're oppressing them. You are not loving them. You are not providing for them. You're not taking care of them. Could that be you? Could God be talking to you and saying, hey, you need to repent in this area. You need to be a better boss. You need to treat your coworkers with respect and honor. And students, you know, obviously, same goes, you know, with you. Students in here, you need to treat your uh, friends with respect and your classmates with respect and you need to be nice to them and love them and be kind to them. Could God be saying, hey, you need to take care of this. So I, I, we, we're all familiar with this. Um, God allows us to have a season of sin. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to have 12 months to do whatever he wanted to do. He waited 12 months to essentially sentence him to his consequence. And God allows us that season. 
And unfortunately, usually when we're in that season, we go, wow, I guess God didn't notice. I guess God didn't notice me do that. He didn't notice what I said. He didn't notice, you know, and time goes by and <laughs> nothing ever happens. They, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing okay. And then all of a sudden, your season runs out. You know, I want to talk about 2 Peter 3, 8 through 10. Verse 8, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, those are some great verses, but let's look at verse 10. So there that season is that God is giving, he's being patient with us. And then all of a sudden in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. And, and so I, I really feel like that... Um, this story is, is, about, is about hope, but a hope that was missed. It, it, is, it is about, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you, have, you can repent. Daniel was saying from God, you, you can turn from this. You can keep this from happening. And so I, I, want, I, I just want to challenge you um, that it only takes God putting one finger in one area of your life to shake you to the core. Just one, one area. It could come in the, in the mail. It could be a letter in the mail. It could be a text message. It could be a friend of yours coming over to talk to you. It could be a phone call. It could be one knock on the door. And you are brought to your knees. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that in your life. And God tries to get your attention. He tries. And so, and the Bible is really, really clear that he tries to get our attention with his kindness. With his kindness, he tries to get it. But you know, many of us were so stubborn that he has to, and y'all have heard this before, he has to hit us with a two by four in order to get our attention. And unfortunately, um, this is what happened in Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's life. And he paid dearly for his arrogance. And so my challenge to you today is what, what is God saying to you? What, what has he been trying to say to you for this past year? And he brings it up over and over and over. It always just bubbles up, bubbles up, bubbles up. When you're in the car, when you're going to bed, when you wake up, you know, it just bubbles up. When you're in Bible study, when you're in your home group, what is, what is God trying to say to you? For some of you, some of you have never personally humbled yourself before God and have acknowledged that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus has given you so many opportunities and he said, I love you. I died for you. I, I gave my life for you. I want you to turn to me. But yet we were busy and we don't hear that. And maybe, maybe when you're in church or Bible study, it, it just keeps coming up, keeps coming up. And my challenge to you is to listen to that voice and turn to God and to repent and to commit your life to Christ. For many of y'all, you know, you, you're already, you've already done that. You've already said, Jesus, you are Lord. I believe in you. But yet that is, it's become lukewarm. Your relationship with Jesus has, you've gotten really busy in life and you've gotten carried away with other things and, and you're, you're not really uh, responding to the Holy Spirit like you used to. When you first became a Christian and you first realized that Christ died for you on the cross and when you first realized, hey, man, Jesus gave his life for me. He loves me. And remember that time when you just came into that relationship with Christ and it was incredible and you had a desire for God's word, you had a desire to pray, you had a desire to do all those things. But yet right now, a couple years into your walk with Christ, maybe 5, 10, 20 years in here, you've gotten stale. 
And God is reminding you, hey, 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 I'm still here. I'm still on the throne. I love you. I want you to acknowledge me like you did 20 years ago. And I don't, I don't know where you are. We're all in different phases and seasons of our lives. And so, but the, I, I believe the challenge here is to, as we finish this service, and as, as we bow our heads and as we talk to God, are we, are we going to listen and are we going to change? Because I think God is calling us to repentance. God is calling us to renew, you know, like David said in Psalm 51, you know, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Then I can sing to you and I can worship you. Uh, you. But you know, I, the warning here is this, the longer you go without responding to that, whatever God has, has been talking to you about, the more hard your heart's going to be. And you're probably going to get angry. And when you hear a sermon like this, you're, gonna be, you're, you're just going to be mad. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. You know, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to deal with that. And, and I get that. And I've been there too. Um, but I think we, we need to be careful that his consequences are great. And, and we need to respond and we need to turn and repent from our sin. And we need to say, God, I, everything I have in my life is because of you. Every single thing. My family is all because of you. My house, my job, all the money that I have in the bank is because of you. And we need to get down on our knees, metaphorically or even just actually getting on our knees. We need to, we need to cry out to God and say, God, I, I owe all this to you. Unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar had to go through so much pain and so much heartache and become like an animal until he acknowledged God in his life. And so my challenge to you and to me is, is to not be like Nebuchadnezzar. It's to not be like, hey, look at all this. This is, this is all me. Everything in my life is because of what I've done. Me, 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 me. And so I think we need to respond to God and we need to say, God, I want to glorify you in my life. I want to acknowledge and give thanks to everything you've done in my life. And God, I want to change and then it takes work. It takes work. It takes Monday morning, you know, bringing that up again uh, and, and writing it down and saying, God, and when you're in the car listening to him and saying, oh, I need to write that down. I need to, I need to put that on my obedience list. And I need to say, God, I want to, you know, I need to take care of that. I need to go talk to that person. I, 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 I've got to do that. That's, that's wrong of me, the way I've treated that person. I need to forgive that person. And, or I need, I need to ask for forgiveness uh, from that person. And so if the, if, I want you to just think in your mind, is God, what has God been telling you this past year? And, and really sit down and try to be quiet and try to allow him to speak in your life for you to respond. Again, because the consequences are great. So right now, I would like for you to just close your eyes, please. Bow your heads before an almighty God. And I would like for you to try to think about what the Holy Spirit has been saying to you. What has the Holy Spirit been, been talking to you about over and over and over that you've ignored? And ask him, you know, ask him, just like David said, just, is there any wicked way in me, God? Would you, would you show me, would you show me this? And so I want to just challenge you to ask God to show you your heart and your sin. And maybe it could be something else about, you know, you need, to, you need to love your spouse better. I mean, we can all do that. You need to love other people better than you have been. Or you need to just finally give up your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. For the first time, I, I want to commit my whole life to you. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. 
And I believe that you rose from the dead. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are worthy to be worshipped and not me. Lord God, I commit my life to you. So I want you to be sensitive this whole week. I want you to talk to God for the next, you know, 10 or 20 seconds. And I want you to just say, God, I want to change. Will you help me? Will you speak to me in a loud voice? Because I've been ignoring you. Will you forgive me?